Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Preselection. In this presentation, we're going to discuss what preselection is, and in particular, why preselection is an important consideration in many types of EMI testing. In order to understand preselection, we first have to understand what mixers are and how they're used in spectrum analyzers and EMI receivers. A mixer is a device that combines or mixes two signals to produce signals at the sum and difference frequencies of those two signals. For example, if our mixer combines an input tone at 200 megahertz and a local oscillator at 300 megahertz, then the output of our mixer will also have signals at the sum, 500 megahertz, and the difference, 100 megahertz, of these two frequencies. The reason that mixers are used to translate signals and frequency is for ease of processing. Higher frequency RF signals are almost always more challenging to work with than lower frequency signals. By using mixers, we can convert input signals over a wide frequency range to a single frequency, and then process those signals with fixed filters or amplifiers with fixed bandwidths. Since the mixer is usually one of the first components in an instrument signal processing change, it's typically exposed to all signals present at the RF input. Even if we set our measurement range or span to only a limited frequency range, say 30 to 1000 megahertz, the mixer will still be exposed to RF power outside of this frequency range. In many instruments, dynamic range can be changed using an input attenuator and or a preamplifier to raise or lower the input signal level. So why are we so concerned about protecting the mixer? There are really two main reasons, compression and spurious mixing products. Let's take a look at each one of these. Like all active devices, mixers are subject to compression at high input levels. Compression has several consequences, the most important of these being incorrect amplitude results and the generation of spurious products. We'll take a closer look at both of these shortly. Mixer compression is even more problematic because in many cases, the mixer may be in compression without any warning from the instrument, such as an IF or RF overload indication. The lack of an overload warning does not mean that we have no spurious products due to mixer compression. Signal distortion can, and often does, occur long before overload is indicated. It's especially important to remember that the signals causing mixer compression may be outside of our current measurement range or span. A high-powered signal can cause mixer compression even if we don't see that signal on our instrument display. There are basically two general categories of mixers, active and passive. As the names imply, active mixers are made from active components, like transistors, and passive mixers are made from passive components, like diodes. Although passive mixers usually introduce some loss, active mixers typically provide some amplification, something known as conversion gain. Mixers, therefore, are liable to the same compression effects typically seen in amplifiers. Gain increases linearly with increasing input power, but at some point our gain curve flattens out, and conversion gain is no longer linear. The result is that the actual mixer output levels are different than the expected mixer output levels. In most cases, this incorrect amplitude is lower than the expected levels, but can actually be higher in some cases, depending on the idiosyncrasies of a particular mixer's design. A mixer in compression can also generate distortion in the form of spurious products, such as harmonics and intermodulation products. In many applications, and especially in EMI measurements, these spurious signals are a significant issue. We want to be sure that the signals that are displayed, and which we're measuring, are actually coming from the equipment under test, not from the measurement instrument itself. Spurious signals can also occur due to the mixing of products in an uncompressed mixer. A mixer, by its very nature, is designed to produce the sum and difference products of two input signals. Normally, this mixing occurs between the input signal and the local oscillator, but a combination of two or more signals at the input can also lead to mixing products. For example, if we look at the span 200 to 400 megahertz, we don't see any signals, including the ones at 150 and 500 megahertz. However, when these signals pass through a mixer, the two tones will combine, and a tone will appear at 350 megahertz, the difference frequency, even though no such tone was present at the input of the instrument. Now that we've seen how important it is to protect the mixer, how do we actually do this? One possible solution we've already mentioned is the use of input attenuation, 
This is an easy thing to implement, and input attenuators are available in almost every type and category of spectrum measuring instruments. However, using a broadband input attenuator can also be problematic. This is because our input attenuator affects all signals equally. We can't use it to attenuate signals at certain frequencies. If we increase input attenuation, we may lose the ability to see smaller or weaker signals, and in some cases, it's precisely these smaller signals that we're interested in. So what we really want is a frequency selective attenuator, in other words, a filter. By placing a filter in front of the mixer, we can reduce the probability of overload and undesired mixing. The problem is, how do we do this over a wide range of frequencies? A tunable filter might be a possibility, but this doesn't work well if we're scanning, something we do quite often in EMI testing. A better solution is to use a bank of filters and pick the appropriate filter based on the current frequency. We can define the number of filters and their respective passbands such that we cover all or most of our instrument's range. This filter bank is called a preselector. A preselector is a type of tracking filter that can be used to limit the range of input frequencies that are presented to the mixer. Preselectors are usually implemented as an automatic, electronically switched bank of filters. The preselector selects or adjusts which filter to use based on the current frequency of the instrument. The preselector automatically switches from one filter to another when the operating frequency changes, and this is done transparently without any user intervention. Note that even though most preselectors are implemented as a bank of filters, a preselector could also be implemented using a single tunable filter. Due to the way that a preselector operates, the input frequency range is essentially subdivided into several subranges, one per filter. There is, however, a practical limit on the number and minimum width of these filters, since the preselector filters must still be wide enough to pass any desired signals or signals of interest without distortion. Let's look at how a preselector works. Without a preselector, input power at all frequencies is passed to the mixer, regardless of working frequency. Let's place a preselector in front of the mixer. Our preselector is implemented as a bank of filters, with each filter only passing a certain range of frequencies. Our instrument automatically chooses which of these filters to use based on our current working or operating frequency. For example, if we're currently at 3 MHz, this filter is used. If we're at 20 MHz, a different filter is used. And if our instrument is scanning over a range of frequencies, the preselector automatically switches between filters at the appropriate times during the scan. Without preselection, our mixer is exposed to all signals, even those that are outside of our given span. For example, we might choose our span such that we only see a single signal but the mixer still sees the sum of powers from all the other signals, signals that we don't even see on our instrument display. If we enable preselection, signals outside of the preselector bandwidth will be attenuated or removed. Preselector filter bandwidths are usually wider than the typical span, so there still could be signals that lie between the preselector bandwidth and the span. These signals could still cause problems, but preselection greatly reduces the probability and the severity of issues due to out of span signals. So, what are the pros and cons of using preselection? The main advantage of preselection is, of course, that it reduces the probability of invalid results due to compression and/or the creation of spurious mixing products. There are, however, a couple of things to keep in mind when using preselection. First, a preselector can increase the time needed to perform a sweep or scan compared to that same measurement without a preselector. This is due to two things. The first is the amount of time needed to switch between the filters in a filter bank or to adjust a tunable filter. The second is the settling time needed for the filter. Less serious considerations include any insertion loss caused by the preselector, as well as the fact that, like all filters, the passband in our preselection filters will not be entirely flat. That said, in the vast majority of cases, the advantages of preselection far outweigh the potential disadvantages. Where are preselectors used? Recall that there are two basic categories of spectrum measuring instruments. These are spectrum analyzers and EMI receivers. Traditional swept or heterodyne based spectrum analyzers are primarily used to make measurements of known signals. In other words, to characterize signals that we are intentionally generating.
Because the user is typically controlling all of the signals that are entering a spectrum analyzer, there's no need for preselection, and therefore most spectrum analyzers do not have the type of preselector described here. When preselection is available on a spectrum analyzer, it can usually be switched on and off by the user. On the other hand, EMI receivers are intended to characterize unknown signals, that is, signals that the user is neither intentionally generating nor can control. Given that we don't have any control over, or knowledge of, the signals that might be appearing at the receiver input, preselection is more or less a necessity for these applications, because it reduces the risk of overload and increases the instrument's dynamic range. Preselection in an EMI receiver normally can't be switched off, and part of the reason for this is that preselection is necessary to make the receiver, or measurement apparatus, comply with various EMI standards, such as CISPR 1611. Before talking about standards compliance, let's first talk a little bit more about the role of preselection in an EMI receiver. As we've already seen, the main purpose of preselection is to protect the front end or the first mixer of our instrument. Recall that this is done for two reasons, to reduce the probability of mixer compression, as well as to reduce the probability of spurious mixing products being generated. This happens primarily in two situations. The first is something we've talked about already, Spectrum content, or power at frequencies other than our current measurement frequency, creates an overload situation, which leads to distortion and amplitude inaccuracies, or a reduced dynamic range. The other situation is related to CISPR 1611, and involves a single, short-duration pulse, which results in very wide spectral content at the mixer. The second situation is a somewhat special case, which we'll need to look at in more detail. Let's start with a brief overview or refresher on CISPR 16.1, which is one of the most important standards for EMI testing. CISPR 16.1 consists of five parts, and the first of these sections places requirements on the measuring apparatus that is used when making compliance measurements. In other words, it specifies certain characteristics and features that a device must have, for example, detector types, in order to be used for compliance testing. CISPR 1611 uses a black box approach in that it defines functionality, not specific pieces of equipment or instruments, so it applies equally to both spectrum analyzers and EMI receivers. And because MIL standard 461 also references CISPR 1611, this means that MIL standard testing also follows the measuring apparatus requirements that are set forth in CISPR 1611. One area of particular concern are the CISPR requirements for pulsed signals. One of the tests required for CISPR compliance is testing with pulse signals. These tests are conducted with different pulse repetition frequencies, or PRFs, and the measurement apparatus must be able to accurately measure these pulses using a quasi-peak detector. This places non-trivial requirements on the instrument with regards to things like sensitivity, dynamic range, and noise floor. Furthermore, as the pulse repetition frequency decreases, accurate measurements become increasingly difficult. So difficult, in fact, that spectrum analyzers without preselection cannot normally measure low PRF signals with sufficient accuracy. The measured values are usually too high. How does preselection help in this case? As you probably already know, a short pulse signal in the time domain corresponds to a very wide signal in the frequency domain. Enabling preselection filters out large frequency domain components of the pulse signal, resulting in a flattening or smearing of the pulse shape. Recall that high instantaneous input voltages can overload our instrument's input, something we'd like to avoid. By using a preselector to decrease the bandwidth of the signal at the mixer input, the resulting pulse takes on different shapes with lower peak voltages. The smaller the bandwidth, the lower the pulse voltage. We can quantify this mathematically by saying the ratio of the peak voltages equals the ratio of the pulse to preselector bandwidth. Using preselection maintains a constant spectral density and ensures that our instrument is CISPR compliant when measuring signals with low pulse repetition frequencies. So in summary, failure to protect the mixer in a spectrum measuring instrument can easily lead to inaccurate measurement results in two main ways. The first is overload or compression of the mixer due to one or more high power signals. The second is creation of spurious mixing products. Both of these can, and frequently are, caused by signals that are outside of our span or current measurement range. 
The most effective solution to this problem is preselection, which is typically implemented as a switchable filter bank. Proper implementation of preselection reduces both the number and the level of undesired mixer inputs, and this in turn reduces overload and spurious mixing products. In particular, preselection is very important for EMI testing. Aside from the obvious advantage of using preselection to measure unknown and uncontrolled signals, preselection is also required by the CISPR 16.1 group of standards, and this is particularly true when making accurate and compliant measurements of pulse signals with low pulse repetition frequencies. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Preselection. If you'd like to learn more about preselection or EMI receivers that implement preselection, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.